All right, good. Welcome, everyone. And as uh, Diane mentioned, I'm John McDougall. I'm with McDougall Interactive Marketing. And John Marr in the background has been with us for 10 years, and we do search engine optimization, web design, and all kinds of digital marketing. And so one of the things that we do that's a little different than other website marketing companies is we talk about authority marketing. And authority marketing ties to Google organic SEO uh, and, and other things like social media in the sense that you want to build up your thought leadership. And so I'm going to talk a little about that as well as uh, get into some SEO specifics. And if anyone has questions, chime in at any time. So this is me at Google headquarters on uh, this conf conference bike that Google made. It's kind of crazy. They have, uh, yeah, yeah. So that's that's a conference bike from Google. And yeah, right. That'd be cool to have this class on the conference bike. <laughs> you just ride around the campus and talk about marketing. So Google invited us to their, their headquarters the last three years in a row. It looks like we're probably going again this year for paid search. And it's just fun to be out there. I'm like a little kid in a candy store at the Google headquarters, um, just being such a marketing geek. Uh, but anyway, so that was one fun thing there. And they have all you can eat, uh, you know, restaurants of all, all types of different food. It's a fun, what's that? Yeah, it's, it's cool to go to their, their main headquarters in Mountain View. Um, so as you know, my, our book, uh, Web Marketing on All Cylinders, and we have a DVD series. We'll give a couple of those out today. Uh, and so authority marketing, position yourself as an expert. And otherwise, you'll be looking at the backside of your competition. You know, if you have a, a graphic design company or, you know, you're, you're a search marketing expert and you have your own website, if you want to get business, the more you can brand yourself, so a little bit of personal branding, uh, the less you'll be, you know, chasing your competition, the more you'll be leading. So our couple of our graphic designers made this little cartoon, you know. If you're not the lead dog, the view is always the same. You don't want to be in that position. Um, and so what is authority marketing? It's branding via specialization. So again, if... Um, you know, if you just say you do internet marketing, you're not going to have as, as good a career potentially as if you have some niche. Can I just, uh, around the room real briefly, how many people do SEO here? Uh, anyone? Uh, SEO, paid search? Anyone experiment with paid search? Social media? Okay, more, more doing social. All right. Graphic design? Okay. And uh, programming? Okay, cool. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, so the more you can pick a niche and really own it, the better. When I was at, at this class one time before, Vicky Martinez was uh, talking with, with me after. Uh, I don't know, does anyone know Vicky? There's a, a student, past student here. And she gave me her business card, and it looked pretty good. It looked like a nice, clean graphic design of a card. And uh, I asked her if she did freelance work, and sure enough, she did. And then we ended up hiring her. and working with her for a while and she did a lot of projects for us. But she really stood out because of that, you know, good business card and it seemed like she was confident that her thing was graphic design specifically. She wasn't trying to do, you know, everything, be a jack of all trades. She had a, a niche that she was good at. So that's what authority marketing is all about. You know, how do you really pick your niche and then start to blog, you know, if you have a blog, if anyone here has a personal blog, you can blog about whatever you're passionate about. And a, uh, a company like, Myself, whether it's an ad agency, internet marketing company you want to work for, like like us, or you know you want to work client side at uh, General Electric or wherever you want to work, um, they might be more impressed if they see you have a blog and you know some content around a specific niche topic. Eventually, if you turn your blog into a book, even a small book, now you're an author and you're going to get more media attention. I was just written about in uh, Forbes and Huffington Post and um, lots of different media features, HubSpot, et cetera. So having a book and a blog can help you get more recognition. It's also great for SEO because Google loves to see that, you know, backlinks from media sites and things like that. So and then you can go out, do public speaking, SEO, social media, get backlinks, as I said, from the, from the media. 
And you know, that will help you get better conversions on your website and you can track it using Google Analytics. And I'll go briefly into a little bit about analytics in a minute. Can you uh, define what backlinks are for you? Yeah, uh, anybody know what a backlink is? No. Okay. Um, and, and so SE, and if no one's done SEO yet, um, step up one step further back. Search engine optimization, instead of running the little paid ads at the top and to the right of Google, it's the, what we call the organic results. So if you search Google for, you know, tax lawyer, uh, you know, Lynn, Massachusetts, there are going to be the paid ads, but why do people come up either in the map listings or in the rest of the results? That's like a magazine where you have the articles and then you have the ads. And so Google organic is the natural results. And there are ways to get higher up in the natural results through organic SEO, search engine optimization. And Google looks at a couple of main, I would call it three main factors. How much text, topical, topically related content you have on your website with keywords in there. And then how many people link to you. So not, you can't just say, I'm a, you know, a tax attorney or whatever, 50 times. You know? If you just keep repeating that all over your page, there's only so much value in just repeating the same keywords all over the page. So Google looks at how much good content, not just crammed in keywords you have on your site. And then they also look at other people pointing to you. Because those people, like, for example, uh, the item live reviewed the, um, the, the little uh, thing last week on uh, the career day. And now, I don't think he did, but it's awesome. Like the, when the New York Times uh, wrote a story about our seminar series, they put an actual link you can click on from the New York Times to mcdougallinteractive.com. Google's going to look at that and say, whoa, this little you know, digital marketing company all of a sudden is associated with the New York Times. And that's called a backlink. Clicking from that article over to our site shows Google some trust and credibility. So it's great to be mentioned. You know, it's possible I was mentioned last week in the item live. I'm not sure if I got in. I talked to the journalist briefly. But what I like to say to journalists is, hey, can, if you mention me, can you please put a link to my site? Because that's really good for, for Google organic SEO. And then the third big uh, leg of the, the stool for SEO is social media. So it doesn't, social media doesn't directly make you go up in the Google ranks, but there's a correlation. Meaning if lots of people are sharing your blog and your content on Facebook and things like that, then you'll probably get more backlinks and more people coming to your website, which you know, it, it will indirectly help you with your uh, search engine optimization. And I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, SEO specifically because I think it's, um, you know, it's one of the most powerful tactics of internet marketing and it drives more traffic typically to most websites than uh, does social media. Paid search is great. You can use the paid ads and get traffic right away and we're big believers in that. But really the biggest websites, Huffington Post and, you know, um, Reddit and things like that. Big websites have a lot of content, then that's going to make them a lot of money because they don't have to pay all the time for ads. You know, if you keep generating content, you're going to create this massive buzz on the internet. Uh, but that really takes not only content, but preferably content that's tied to real people, individuals, or what we like to call authorities, experts that are not only experts in their kind of in the classroom or in their, you know, in, the, in their own office or whatever, experts that are mentioned in the New York Times and in Huffington Post and things like that, that makes you more of an authority. So a thought leader. <laughs> so uh, this little guy at the front, he's in, he kind of in charge, he's a, he's a leader. And that's, it, it's basically built into nature that birds flock and fish school. You know, we, we, it, it's kind of in our DNA to follow leaders. And so examples, you know, Donald Trump, a leader in real estate, Oprah, this guy's a financial, uh, you've seen this guy, Jim Cramer. It's kind of like whole personas, like he's kind of crazy, mad TV. Yeah, he's funny. He's pretty funny. He's definitely out there, but he tells it how it is. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I like him, even though I don't invest in stocks. Yeah. 
but you'd trust his advice more than the next person potentially. Yeah. 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 He's built up his thought leadership. Rachel Ray, she, she has a real, again, it's a niche. 30 minute meals, it's not just recipes, it's 30 minute meals, that's different. You know, it's, you have to pick an angle and really go for it. 30 minute meals isn't uh, just any old concept. It's, she really targets that. And Dr. Phil for psychology. And then for uh, content marketing thought leaders, this is an interesting little chart that shows the page rank of the website of these top experts. Content marketing being part of SEO and um, you know it, it's the idea that you wouldn't just do ads all the time. You develop helpful content, stories, articles, blog posts, infographics, videos, podcasts, and then you would put that out to get more business for a company. And these are some of the top experts in the world associated with the hashtag content marketing. And so the Twitter handles there on the left, and, their, and then of course their name, but this is the page rank of their site. So not only is it important to look at a thought leader through the lens of social media, like how many Twitter followers do they have, and you know, how connected are they on social media, but how big is their blog and their website? Do they get a lot of unique visitors on their site? So eventually, if you guys start your own blogs, it's great if you can get connected on social media and get a following, but maybe even greater if you can also get a lot of visitors and a lot of content, a lot of blog posts, and that just really builds up your website's trust and credibility. John, what's the, can you back for a second? Yeah. what's the difference between, so you must follow these people, or know them? Some of them, yeah, not all of them. So what's the yeah, difference Joe between Paluzzi's. the rank of number one and number two? Like, what is number one doing that number two isn't doing to get that big of a, a delta? Basically, what I said earlier about the three big stools, so if you have a big website with a lot of blogs and content, that's one, so size. We, we joke we have a tool we're making called Size Matters. You know, ha, 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 that, um, you know, size, but size matters in, in SEO. You know, the, if you have a big website, assuming the content is quality, if you just go out and blast out a bunch of crap, you know, stupid pages, then size doesn't matter. Google's gonna discredit that. But assuming all of these people had a 100 page website, and the quality was all identical, and somebody else goes and adds another five or 10 pages, they may go up. Because again, if the quality is all equal, more pages does make a difference, but it really hinges on quality. And then backlinks, so more links and more social. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, you just spoke on trust and credibility for mm -hmm. websites. I was wondering if you could actually do that with a mobile app. So in terms of mobile app, would you take the same process that trust and credibility with your customers or would use a different channel or what process would you utilize to achieve the same result? You know, I was just reading about something about that this morning and we're not, we, we built some mobile apps way back in the day. We haven't done much with that lately, but literally just this morning I was reading about um, getting mobile apps to rank and Google uh, on April 21st, this coming, you know, less than a month from now, on April 21st, Google's launching a new algorithm that's going to affect a huge amount of websites. And if you build a, a more mobile-friendly website that loads faster, you're going to have better results, and it's going to affect mobile apps ranking. So it does. This stuff does relate specifically how you. So you want to get your app high in the Google rankings? Yeah. So I haven't optimized an app, so I don't want to give you misinformation, but uh, it was on search engine land, and if you want to give me your email, I'll look for the article I was just reading this morning. So it's just new Google but it relates. The API, or does it do something else? The API for? For its, for its algorithms, for how it runs. I mean, so are, what does it exactly does it run on? So if I were to develop an app, what algorithms would I have to, what specifications would I have to need to then launch it? with Google's new specifications? Yeah, again, with specifically ranking an app in, in Google, I'm not positive, but the article I was reading this morning did talk about trust and authority. So um, I think there is something, 
uh, there's, it was talking a bit about uh, rich snippets and schema, the whole thing of identifying. Your app, have you done that for, for the app or the pages? Do you have a website for the app? Uh, I have a prototype. You have a prototype? Okay. Um, so the app can rank itself, apparently, right? Is that what you're seeing? Like when you search Google, are you seeing other apps yeah. ranking? Do you see their page ranking or the app specifically? The app the app itself, yeah. So there is a whole bit of tactics to rank for that. And again, I haven't done that specifically. But um, yeah, again, give me your email address and I'll look, look at that more. But I, I think you know, the, the key, in my opinion, is to look at how Google tends to rank anything. You know, whether it's an app or a web page, it's about authority. So why is your app more authoritative? And I'll get the, into that in a minute with an acronym called EAT, Expertise, Authoritativeness, and Trustworthiness. And that will relate whether it's an app or, or a regular page. So I'll try and address it a little more. What are the numbers? So page rank is a Google thing that is a way to value, to judge your website on a, on a you know, score of 1 to 100. Okay. And it's, it's affected by things, again, like content, social media, backlinks. And your website status will go up in PageRank if you do all of those things, you know, uh, adding helpful content. You know, we don't follow PageRank every day. Like, you have to look at it all the time. You want to keep, just keep doing good, helpful, trusted content. Um, content around your app, things like that. You know, you should be blogging on the app and getting the app featured in the media. You know, if, if the New York Times is linking to the app or TechCrunch or some techie blog reviewing you, those are gonna help your app rank, you know? I think we gotta use college as like Salem State as a uh -huh. primary channel. Yeah. So building trust with that. That's you know, awesome. Is Colleges are great. In person, yeah. you know, you uh -huh. see the face behind the product. Yeah. You can build a trust through that. Now That's awesome. Point, if there's a better or different process to use for mobile apps that would achieve the same and best results that you would with SEO and in terms of big websites like, you know, Huffington Post. And yeah. Amazon. That I don't know. You know, I'll just be honest. I, you know, I haven't tried to rank an app on its own without, you know, that I mean, page. That's not really content marketing. So it, it's, it's, it's more like keyword, you have your certain keyword searches. If you put in your certain specification, you're going to get your, you know, your uh, results from the certain constraints that you put in. Mm -hmm. And you know, obviously, it's going to weigh your content and things of that nature. So I don't know if it exactly could work the same than achieve the same results within the mobile app. I mean, this is something I would be. Yeah. No, I'm curious too. Yeah, that, that'd be interesting to look at. But I would figure out how to get trust signals, you know, because ultimately Google is always looking at trust signals, you know, because there are so many people that just want to spam it and, hey, I created this app and, you know, um, everybody wants to get to the top, so some people will be willing to do unethical or crazy things to get up there. Okay. So... Do you have, like, a top five best practices or yeah. that nature to develop? Uh, trust signals for, I mean, I, I, if you don't know about that for a website itself or something maybe relating close to a mobile app. Yeah, I was going to ask you the same thing. On the app specifically? No, Interesting. Just on like, just like ways just to rank yourself and, you know, like you said earlier, trust signals. Yeah, so I would say, you know, backlinks are, are at the heart of Google's algorithm, so you're going to need to get links. And actually, you know, let, let me see. Um, Actually, this this actually addresses it. Is it backlinks through social media primarily, or is that no. sort of a subset? Is, is there a first and foremost thing that you want to use, and then use social media as your subset to that? So backlinks from websites are a direct signal to Google that, if assuming the website is quality, you know, the New York Times or a college website, you know, links from schools are great. Uh, links from uh, topically related sites. So again, is it is TechCrunch or something technology related website reviewing your app and linking to you? Those are signals that are going to be heavily trusted by Google. At this moment, backlinks from actual websites are more powerful of a direct signal than a social media link. Okay. How but does so credibility though. It determines credibility um, because they're looking at the relationship. And actually, let me explain this, this chart because this actually talks to the heart of Google's algorithm for determining that trust. 
So Google, uh, let, let me actually go forward one second. Google was originally called Backrub. <laughs> that was their name, yeah. Well, yeah, well, this was before they became Google, right? They were trying to pick a name. <laughs> it's a weird name, right? Um, Google's initial name was Backrub in reference to the way it de uh, was designed to check backlinks in order to rank a site for search results. And so this is the actual, you know, page rank um, algorithm. I'm not, you know, that great with math to understand the things that, you know, go into some of that and I won't even attempt to, but the bottom line is, again, Google's looking at trusted sites, and so much so that they almost name themselves back, back rub, which I find pretty funny. But so th this is in 1997, um, a provisional patent on PageRank, and these represent websites linking to other websites. And so if you get a lot of different sites linking up to one, you know, sort of a hub or a powerful website that's linking to this site. The fact that all these sites are linking here to B, that means that B has the most page rank because there's a whole bunch of other people that are like, wow, this site's great, you know? All the, you know, New York Times, the North Shore Community College, they're all linking and relating up to B. B is the biggest authority. But even if that one site links one time over to C, it's going to pass a huge amount of trust because you're associated with the big, bad, cool site. Okay. One link from a powerful site is worth more you know, than, than lots of links from low uh, quality sites. So you want to ideally go after the big boys, you know, you, the, the bigger sites, yeah. higher quality sites. So if you were looking to do that, so say you take your website, wanted something like the Huffington Post to feature you, mm -hmm. is that something where you would reach out to them and say like, hey, I'd, I'd like to share your content yeah. first? And then well, yeah, so I, I was just featured on the Huffington Post and um, I reached out to one of their writers and said, hey, I have a story. Um, it was actually someone from there that knew me and we, we, we started a little email conversation and I said, hey, you know, I, I see that you're doing great writing on this topic. and." I really like what you're doing, and I could add to that, and I was able to get featured. So I don't know if anyone here has ever done traditional public relations, but PR people, that's what they do. They go and they talk to journalists and try and you know, get on their good side and say, hey, we can give you some valuable content. The good news right now is, I guess it's good and bad news, there's so much media, right? The Huffington Post, 117 million visitors a month to the Huffington Post. That's bigger than CNN and the New York Times. Yeah, Really? Yeah. 117 million unique visitors a month. That's an authority site. So a backlink from that's awesome. But you have to kind of weasel your way in, if you will, you know? And it's easier to get yourself in if you're a trusted authority. So if I'm going to reach out to the Huffington Post and the New York Times to one of their writers, I want to find a writer that writes just in my wheelhouse. And I want to send them a link to my blog and say, hey, you know what? AuthorityMarketing.com is all about thought leadership. You've been writing about thought leadership. Would you like it if I would write an article for you? Or you're welcome to use quotes from me, and I'll help you in any way I can. Just try and be helpful. You know, just reach out to them and offer up your content, your knowledge, without beating them over, you know, beating them up too much. But you just want to reach out. You send them an email. You, you know, another way to do it is to go and read blogs like the Huffington Post. And if you see, you know, identify maybe 10 thought leaders that you want to follow and then start commenting on their blog posts, retweeting their articles, all of a sudden you're on their radar. You know, they're like, whoa, who's this guy who's got an app? He just keeps retweeting my stuff. Let me check out his app. Next thing you know, you're in a conversation on Twitter or, you know, sending him an email. And so if you're supplementing these websites with your content, what are you getting directly as an outcome for that for McDougal? So there's two things. One is credibility. So I can now email my customers and say, hey, we've been featured on the Huffington Post, 117 million unique, uh, unique visitors. They're the largest blog in the world. Aren't we awesome? You know, a little pat on the back. And that's big. That helps. Yeah, big. That's, that helps a lot. But from my perspective also, what I love is the backlink, you know, because I'm trying to increase my trust because Google still vary into if you can get a link to your app from Huffington Post, you're probably better than someone that can. 
So that goes right to the very early days of Google opening their business. Them, you know, this is their first, um, you know, pass at, at, at their, um, you know, at their algorithms. Apparently Larry Page, one of the founders of Google, the guy that, um, you know, filed for this, he had a dream where he downloaded the entire internet and saved just the backlinks. So they're, they're like way into to links and trust. But now, you know, you can't do it in a cheesy way by just like posting a link on a forum and putting your backlink to your site or putting yourself in some crappy directory. Now it's all, you really have to do a legitimate job to show that you're worthy of that link. Yeah, you gotta really build your brand and, you know, your trust in the social Yeah. Because. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. So I see it all the time in like comment sections where people will post a link. Is that like not as effective or even useful? Yeah, I mean, you can you could post if it's occasionally if if you are. Well, let me put it this way: if you're regularly commenting on somebody's work, and it just makes logical sense to put in a link to something that's related, occasionally you can do that. But if you have a tactic to just go spam out all the forum, you know, all the blog comments and just keep putting your link, that's a bad no-no. Don't yeah, do that. Can you, like, like, would that person be able to, like, block you or something if you do something like that? Yeah, I mean, they can, depending if they have their comments auto, just regularly posting. But usually um, blog comments are often, they're, they're no-followed anyway. There's a thing called no-follow versus do-follow. So Google will... Um, look at a website and if it has a tag in there that says don't follow these links to pass link juice we call it you know link energy if it's a no follow link like a link in a, a you know in a blog comment any smart seo um, knows when there's a no follow situation you're not going to do it for the link juice for seo reasons you're going to do it to get to just be helpful and put good information so you could put a link in there occasionally, but it's really frowned on if you're just spamming it to just keep slapping in links, and it's, that's not the way to build good trust. You know, build your relationship by commenting on their post but adding value, and then if they keep seeing you adding value and all of a sudden they get an email from you, it's like, hey, that's the guy that has the app, you know? Let me, let me, let me consider his article because he's been a valuable contributor in the blog comments as opposed to bye bye agree here. You know? yeah. <laughs> Classic blog comment spam. So anyway, so Google was called Backrub originally, and they have patents around authors. And I don't know if anyone remembers, but you used to search Google. Last year they killed this off. But you'd search Google, and people's faces would show up in the results. Yeah. Does anyone remember that? I mean, it still happens with certain things, like I think uh, in-depth articles, and um, you know, there are certain scenarios where it still happens. but. It was a thing called Google Plus Authorship. So if you create a Google Plus personal profile and then link it to your blog and back and forth, you, you basically tell Google, hey, look, I'm an author and I have a blog. And then when people search Google for you know, best mobile apps, not only does your blog post show up or your app show up, but boom, there's your face. How cool is that? You know, we were all loving that because we could get our clients' faces there and they were getting big increases in clicks. But Google killed that off. Um, I won't go into all the reasons why, but the lack of adoption and maybe SEOs were spamming it too much, so various reasons they killed, killed that off. But um, there, without reading this paragraph, essentially Google has uh, patents to score not only a web page, but who the author of the web page is. So as you're doing internet marketing and you're going out there you know, in your careers, just again, that's, that's a, a thing you just have to think about. Google is looking who's the author of this app and of the content on the web page. Not just how good is the content, but who's actually this person writing it. Because the web is so spammed out, if you will, so many people trying to game the system, they're looking for credible signals. And so there's actually a Google Quality Raiders guide. You can't find it on Google because they're there were, it's really a leaked document. You can go on to Bing and find it, and really it's, it's perennially leaked, meaning it's like every year it gets leaked. Um, 
But basically, so if you go to Bing, you can search for Google Quality Rater Guide and you can find this guide. And Google hires employees to, um, you know, I think it's at like 10 or $15 an hour. There might be five, 10,000 of these people. And they're using this 100 plus page manual to judge websites. And they're asked to look at websites using the acronym EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. And so, um, you know, that's a leaked document, but in reality, you know, uh, how is it bad to know about that? Like, so Google wants you to have a quality website. That's a good thing that we know that. Um, so again, you need to be an expert, ideally an, uh, an authoritative expert that has media features and trustworthy. So if people search, you know, what's your mobile app about? I have two. One deals with providing more specific search queries and others about your mobile app. Oh, okay. So, you know, if someone searches for, you know, uh, the name of your app plus reviews and then it gets trashed all over the internet, then they're going to give it a lower score. But if they see good positive reviews, they'll give it a higher score. So that's where the trustworthiness comes in from that acronym. And so, I'll just read very briefly. Make sure your content is written by experts. Google has placed a strong emphasis on perceiving, on perceived expertise for determining quality. And according to Google, high quality pages and websites need enough expertise to be authoritative and trustworthy on their topic. So this is an infographic you can find on Google. It's on Audience Bloom. And that's about the quality raters guide that gives you more information on how to be seen as an expert. Yeah. You talk a lot about Google. I'm curious, how does Bing's algorithms differentiate from Google in terms of providing uh, more specified, you know, queries? So we don't place a lot of emphasis thinking about Bing's algorithms, even though it's a it's certainly a valid search engine. Usually, we're so focused on Google that we figure Bing will be reasonably um, happy with the results if we do a great job for Google. Bing will, will be uh, reasonably satisfied. Now, there are special things that Bing has that you would want to satisfy, but it's the market share is small enough where we're not, not on a daily basis like we are with Google um, as focused on it. Okay. Not to say you shouldn't, but depends on your market. The whole thing is that they can provide more specific queries than Google can. Mm -hmm. So how do they do that? How do they provide better searches, you know, focusing on, I imagine, content and keyword searches unless they develop some other algorithm to provide, you know, more specified searches to the users, you know, providing I don't know. I, I personally haven't seen it, you know. I mean, I still prefer Google myself, but there, who said that Bing provides better search results? Well, that was their whole, not mission statement. Bing. Bing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Bing yeah. I mean, you know, maybe they're making some headway, but I'm not, you know, their market share is so small that I... Uh, Isn't their mark value rated second to Google? Uh, I'm correct about that. More than all their stuff. Yeah, but but there's Google and Google owns YouTube, so YouTube's the second largest search engine, then Bing, Yahoo. Right, right. So yeah, they're 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 close. I mean, I I don't want to belittle Bing completely. Believe me, it's it's a valid search engine, and you you want to rank well in it. I'm just saying, Google is so much more sophisticated in our opinion. If you work on the algorithms that that Google is is doing. Uh, that that's plenty to have to deal with, you know. Right. But if your audience is really on Bing, I would look at your Google Analytics and see if your audience is heavily coming from Bing. Then I would focus on, you know. I'm not even so much focusing on the eyes. I'm just focusing on if, if Bing can provide a better SEO than Google can, and if they do, what practices do they implement to provide more specified query constraints that the user gives? Well, I just, I, I personally don't think they do provide better results than Google, and that's pretty much the state of the industry right now, that they're far behind Google. So if, you know, but again, they're totally valid. I just, I, I, I seriously doubt pretty much anyone would agree that they're ahead of Google in terms of quality. Right, okay. That's just my, that's my opinion. Anyone else, what does anyone else think about that? Does anyone use Bing? No. No one? <laughs> so, in, in this room, there's not one person that uses Bing. Does everyone use Google? So I don't know if that's. I'm not saying Bing's horrible. I'm just oh, saying no, just they're making some good progress. I, they're. I use Google as well. I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe more done the branding purposes that we all use Google rather than Bing. But I was just right. curious if you are uh, 
Or the, any other SEO practices that they Specific to Bing. Yeah, specific not, to Bing. Not really, yeah, yeah. Because be, again, because we we have our hands full so much with what Google's doing that we have we have steered away from putting a lot of emphasis on Bing. But again, if my audience was like we had one client that was a mesothelioma attorney, which is lung cancer caused by asbestos, they had an older crowd, and you know we were looking at Bing and AOL and you know trying paid ads on Bing and AOL, um, you, you know related. Um, Basically, if you have an older audience or certain, certain specific niches and Bing is more important to that niche, then you want to kind of dive in there a little more. But in general, we're, you know, we're just not, we're not blown away by Bing. One of my clients just yesterday sent me a, a funny text and it had like, it had like a, a gate like for a company, like you couldn't see through it. And at the top it had like the Microsoft logo and it said, hey kids, want some Bing? Like they were trying to like lure people in, you know, like getting young people into Bing. But I don't know, you know, I actually would like it if Google had more competition. I, I was doing this in 1995 and uh, in the 90s, we used to use a, a tool called Web Position Gold and we would make different, the same page, like say we had a page about web design on our agency site. We would make 10 versions of that page, one for AOL, one for Lycos, one for Alta Vista. We'd make, they were called doorway pages. It is so, bad now it's like ultra evil even I feel dirty just talking about it <laughs> but you know we used to do these like cheesy things and um, you know we would try and target web position gold had the algorithms of you know their own thoughts around the algorithms for each different search engine and we would make different pages specific to each one but you know since Google's been so dominant we really kind of focus there but so this, this, these are just some factors that, that tie into author rank, Google, Google what, what we would call author rank. Um, you know, how many people are plus wanting or sharing your posts, uh, relative authority on non-Google social networks, comments per post, if you're blogging, do people often comment on your work, authority of publishing sites, posting how, frequency, how often are you posting, how many people are in your Google Plus circles, um, you know, engagement levels. They're all different things that Google will judge if you're a good author or not. And then clout, cred, and peer index are tools that can judge your social media to see if you're heavily, you know, um, in LinkedIn, are people commenting and liking your content, commenting and liking your posts on, on Facebook, retweeting you, mentioning you on Twitter, you know, Foursquare and Google Plus, you know, comments and reshares and things like that. Has anyone ever heard of clout? Yeah. You know, I, I was talking to a guy that I met at Google, um, you know, one of their employees that, that deals with analytics, and he was like, eh, you know, just his personal opinion, this isn't some official Google statement, but he said, you know, clout is uh, certainly a, a novel thing, but in, and I think it's valid to give you a, a general signal of like how, how much engagement you have on your social and how much are you doing social, but you know, it can be gamed, so you have to be careful putting too much weight into something that can be gamed. But I, I still think they're, they're great to check out and making headway. So SEO is now less and less about on-page optimization and more about social sharing and overall brand reputation online. So SEO, again, it's like, you know, making title tags on, on a page, on a website to put keywords in, putting the keywords in the heading tag, putting them throughout the text. There are a lot of things that SEOs do that are, are still valid, but there are a lot of things that um, you know, can be gamed and you can overdo them. So now you wanna think, like you were saying earlier about branding, you know? it's about building up, that's where it's headed is. You wanna build up your, your personal brand and then your company brand. You, wanna, you, know, you want your personal branding to rub off on whatever company you're at. Yeah. And Google can judge on the left, this is, uh, this actually, Dwayne Forrester of Bing did a webinar um, um, that I was on and I, I got a little screenshot from that or from one of his blog posts. And he, he, he was really good actually. Dwayne Forrester of Bing is probably, some, I would follow that guy actually. If you're, if you're thinking about Bing, he's really interesting. They fired him recently and I think brought him back on. But, um, or let him go and I don't know, some controversy, whatever. But he's, he's a really bright guy at Bing. Um, but he, he was the first one to turn me on to this whole concept of what it looks like when you, um, you know, 
has anyone heard of Fiverr? How you can pay five bucks for pretty much anything? You can get a logo. You can get people to do random internet stuff for like five bucks. Um, but you can buy likes on Facebook, for example, on Fiverr, which oh, is a can? don't. Yeah, and don't do it. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> sad. Though. It's sad. Yeah, it's cheesy, really right? Yeah, that's like going in the, the playground and be like, dude, I'll give you some Skittles if you like me or like, you know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I, I, I like, heard, geez, I heard, like yeah. if, if Facebook finds that out, they'll like shut your face down. Well, yeah, I mean, anything artificial, just don't do it. You know, it's, I mean, with that said, of course, we're like building content and asking people to link to it and doing public relations by reaching out to people. That's all real world stuff that you're gonna do, but you need to do it in a way that's authentic as opposed to crap like buying, buying likes. I mean, anyway, so they can see it looks unnatural. If you buy likes, it looks like that on the left. And if you get it naturally, you're building likes through real relationships and engagement. Apparently it looks like that to a search engine, to Bing. Um, I don't, you know, however, that, whatever that means, essentially I take away from that there's lots of little organic connections, like I like you, you like me, and in a, a real authentic way, as opposed to just bought like Sun Fiverr and they just go, they just blop on, you know what I mean? So the, the search engines have ways to detect that. So modern marketing, this guy Gary Vaynerchuk, he talks about uh, the idea of jab, jab, right hook. That's a good book. Have you read that? No, but my, my you've heard of that? Yeah, my friend. I haven't read it either, but I've yeah. Yeah, it's on, my, it's on my list, of, unfortunately, this huge list. I've seen him speak, and uh, the idea is, um, you know, give, 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 and then occasionally, hey, you want to buy my app? <laughs> you know, but it's like free content, free content, free content, free blog post, free infographic, a little, you know, YouTube video, and then you make an occasional, hey, you know, maybe 10, 20% of the time you're throwing out a little link to your app, but most of the time you need to be giving away some content. And so to get more into SEO, and, and how long do I have so I uh, know um, how to judge? Our stop at 10 past. 10 past, okay. Um, and are, are people interested in SEO in terms of how to do it a little bit? Um, I'll, I'll help to answer that question. Mm -hmm. For next week, they have three chapters to read from your book. Mm -hmm. SEO essentials, implementation, content is king. And to do a competitive analysis for a chocolate site. Cool. On what's going on. So they are very interested in SEO. Oh. <laughs> 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 you're like, right. I love how you're like, what's SEO? You're going to have to do it no matter what. Uh -huh. <laughs> Bam. Nice. On what's hot in SEO? And, you know, the, and of course they don't, they won't have 2015 until later. Um, holistic context based approach is cru crucial for content quality. Basically, build not only good content and pages about you know mobile apps for this topic and this topic, but write lots of sub pages and, and link them all together so you really cover topics and have a lot of content. Um, and then technical performance is, is important now and April 21st when Google's coming out with this new algorithm to you know speed up the web and have everything be mobile friendly, um, that's gonna be even more important. Uh, proportion of keywords, uh, links dropped on average. Um, you don't want to spam every time someone links to you. You don't want to say use the word mobile apps and the link to me. You want to vary it with more natural things. Let them pick the anchor text. Um, social signals, correlations discre decrease slightly but are still high. So there is still a relationship of social media affecting your ability to come up in Google. And then user signals uh, are increasingly more important. So if you build a crappy website and you want it to rank in Google, you can't just get more links to it and add more content. You have to address the usability and the quality of your site. So when people click from the Google page to your website, they don't just hit the back button and say, geez, they were number one for mobile apps, but you know, I clicked their blog or you know, if it was going to your site, for example, if they click your site, and the site's crap, and they, or they go to the app, and the app looks like the design or whatever they get to on that app page is crap, and they hit the back button, that's a signal to Google that, you know, maybe that shouldn't be at the top of Google. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so it's about quality, you know. They have to, when they hit your site, you want to engage them and suck them in and get them reading content and watching videos and things like that. 
<coughs> so the perfectly optimized page, this is a little bit older from Moz. I don't know if people know Moz, M-O-Z.com. Um, Moz is a fantastic um, company that has a, one of the world's largest blogs on search engine optimization with great free information, software, and all that. And this guy, Rand Fishkin's one of the thought leaders. He's the founder of Moz. He always wears yellow sneakers to conferences, so he kind of stands out, and he has a like, handlebar mustache. So he's a little, little crazy. He has a thing called Whiteboard Fridays and uh, YouTube videos all about this stuff. But anyway, on, on a page, so this is a website page, and in the title, do people know what the title tag is at the top of the browser? Um, you know, when you're looking at, at, at uh, Chrome or Internet Explorer or whatever, at the very top of the page, not on the words that you're reading, but up above, it's the title tag makes what, what com shows up in the, in, the, in the top there. And Google likes to have a clean title tag that describes what the page is about. This is in the HTML code. But as SEOs, we write those keywords. We do Google keyword research using the Google Keyword Planner. There's this free Google tool. You have to open an account, an AdWords account. But you get the free Google tool, and you can put in there chocolate donuts <clears throat> or you know, donut shop Lynn, Massachusetts. And then Google will show you how many people search for those different terms. And you can pick the terms that seem the most relevant to you and that get some search volume and then put them on your website and then all of a sudden people are going to come to your donut shop in Lynn because yeah that's search engine optimization so a couple of things are hidden in the page the, the, in the code, the HTML code and we just have our programmers do this for us the SEO people don't necessarily have to go in and do that, some do um, but at, at a company like ours we have a developer that handles all that but we pick the keywords, we write a clean title tag like chocolate donuts from Mary's Bakery, and then a meta description. You know, when you search Google, <clears throat> you'll see the title tag and the meta description. That's the search results of Google. Google can take that description from other places, but if you have a good meta description in your website pages, that will actually show up in the Google results. So you want to make those uh, keywords in the title tag and then you can put a keyword in the meta description, but it's, it's not going to help your rankings. But you want to make the meta description interesting, like learn the three secrets to whatever. You know? So anyway, so title and meta description are important. And then putting keywords in the URL. So you know, myapp.com slash mobile hyphen app for searches or whatever. You, know? you want to hyphenate, not underscores. We, you know, Google likes to see hyphens, it helps separate the words, and you want to put those keywords in the URL structures as you build your website. And then when you get down to the page level, you want to put chocolate donuts or mobile apps in the heading. You know, don't go crazy and stuff it all over the place, but you know, you want to have it clearly in the heading, somewhere in the, in the page text. And you want to have, you know, no blocks that, you know, stop Google from seeing the page. You should have share buttons on your valuable content, and your content should be uniquely valuable, as opposed to just grabbing content from some other mobile site and stealing it and throwing it on your site, which would be duplicate content. Google can read all that and you know, block you if you do that. So have a good user experience, UX, keywords targeted on the page, be good for mobile, multi-device ready, use metadata like meta descriptions and, and potentially schema. Uh, markup and things like that. So that's the very brief rundown of what we call on-page SEO or optimization. Outside of getting backlinks, this is one of the things that you have to do to get a website to come up in Google. And so just to review that, the optimization basics including a title tag, meta tags, mostly the meta description, um, heading tags on the page, body text, Alt tags, like when there's a picture, if you can mouse over that picture and a little keyword pops up, that sends a small signal to Google. It's mostly it's great for, um, you know, if you do Google, search Google and then you click the images tab. If you have done a good job naming your pictures with a, with a keyword, the JPEG itself, not DSC 624 from your mobile phone, or from your camera, um, you want to name your pictures with good keywords when you upload them into your website and then put alt tags on them, and then put keywords around the photo to say, hey, this is a photo of chocolate donuts, and then Google will 
better understand what that is about, and you'll come up more. And again, the URLs, the, the names of the pages matters to Google. And so content silos, won't go into a lot of detail, but if you have a, you know, you have your home page, but then if you have a page for mobile apps, mobile games, mobile phones, whatever, different categories, if you, you should preferably have not only a mobile app page, but then if you have mul multiple mobile apps or different blog posts about mobile apps, they should all link up to the master page. So you create one like mothership, like the main page about mobile apps and all the stuff that relates to it should, mini pages. mini pages exactly that go with it. So this example, worldofwidgets.com slash blue widgets, blue hyphen widgets, that's what we call the silo or a category page on a website. After that is, is a page within that bucket, that folder, because again, there's a slash here and a slash here, that's segregated as a folder on the server, and then fuzzy hyphen blue hyphen widgets.html. That's one page out of potentially many within a silo that link up to the main page about mobile apps, and then you're gonna rank better for mobile apps because you've created a whole bunch of content opposed to just one page with cramming in a lot of keywords. So anyway, that's called siloing. That's in my book, you'll be, you'll be reading about that. And so the different algorithms with Google, um, Panda versus Penguin. Panda is an algorithm where Google is looking at duplicate content. If, again, if you steal content from someone else's site and throw it on yours, or even do that by mistake, like you put two versions of your you know, one page on your site and name them with a different HTML page name, that's bad, you, you can't do that. And Google Panda is the algorithm where they started to get really sophisticated at blocking people that were spamming with duplicate content. And Penguin is the algorithm where they look at if you're doing a, you know, too much blog, like you were talking earlier about you know, going in and commenting on blogs, if people are going crazy with that and getting in all kinds of bad directories and doing all the like, low level link building stuff, because you know link building is important to Google, but you know, a lot of people will just go out <clears throat> and do the easiest path to, to get that done. Penguin, that algorithm came out in April of 2012, and it's amazing, like it's to be feared, basically. <laughs> like, you don't wanna cross Google by going and getting crappy backlinks because it will burn you and make your life miserable. But we have a lot of clients that come to us and you know, they're gonna pay, you know, whether it's 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 dollars a month, and we have to clean up all that crap that their past SEO companies did first. Yeah, you got to clean it. Yeah, it's a, that's a really good example. So basically what you do is you run their websites for them? Well, some clients were just doing SEO and some were running the whole site, designing it, building it, programming it. You know, but a lot of them, they just have us do the SEO and they have their own web designer. But plenty, we're, we like it when we can handle the website too because a lot of times other web designers don't know all the SEO stuff and it creates a problem. We're trying to do the SEO and the programmer keeps doing crazy stuff and we have to deal with that. And then Hummingbird is a uh, newish algorithm that uh, Google is better at, uh, you know, if you search Google from Siri, you know, your mobile phone or an Android and you just talk to your phone. Um, Google, there's so much search now where people are doing that. Google had to get better at responding to those longer queries, natural search queries. So that was Hummingbird, um, and Google Pigeon is about local, so why you'd come up in the map listing. And now the, even the map stuff, you know, like Pizza Shop or Donut Shop, Lynn, Massachusetts, um, Google is now looking at trust and authority symbol, signals even more than they were before Pigeon. So anyway, they have these crazy names for, for uh, yeah, right? So we have a tool called Link Detox uh, by Link Research Tools is the company. And if you think you have bad backlinks and you've, you know, you have a website where you've done a bad job with that, you'll want to clean it up. And Link Detox is one tool to do that. But Google provides you within Google Webmaster Tools, which is, you know, free and you can just sign up for that. Google gives you a link to disavow these links. You basically make a list using a tool like Ahrefs, which uh, I have this uh, right here is Ahrefs. This tool, you can check how many people are linking to your website, and if some of those links, like great, Huffington Post, that's awesome, really good to have that. Forbes, I've got those two links, actually this isn't me, but those are 
you know, those are great links. But if you've got a link from, you know, ViagraSpammer.com, you know, you know, that's bad. Or like a porn link, you know, like um, actually we have a client right now, a, an attorney who claims that one of his competitors is buying porn links on Fiverr for five bucks and pointing them at his site. And this is, this, I'm not just making this up. And yeah, it's crazy, right? But see, a lot of the attorneys are all kind of aggressive. They want, you know, they want to get the business, which, you know, makes sense. But um, some of them will cross a line and that's odd beyond spam. That's unethical and illegal, you know, like you're, I don't know what you'd call that, bad. Um, but buying porn links to your competitors, <laughs> bad. But <laughs> don't do that. But, um, but believe it or not, because Google is now sophisticated with Google Pigeon, it opens the door maybe a little bit that you could, there could be negative, we call it negative SEO. So if you've been attacked by negative SEO, a competitor sending bad links to your site, Google gives you that tool, that opportunity to say, hey, some, either I did a bad job with this or uh, a competitor did it, please know that I didn't meet, I don't want that and I want to do a nice, good, clean job and get links from Huffington Post and all that. It cleans it up. It's almost like cookies, basically. That's just how I, that's how I. Oh, I mean, that's an analogy. Like when you clean the cookies yeah. the, or the cache on your website, it's, it, yeah, it kind of lets you start over, you know? Um, so how do you get good links? Posting podcasts and videos on your site is good. If you do, like this site, Mixergy.com, they interview all kinds of marketing experts. I do this as well with uh, authoritymarketing.com and McDougal Interactive. In fact, just th this afternoon, I have an interview with Conductor, who's one of the top SEO companies. I'm going to do a podcast interview with them at, at, I think, four today. And then, you know, they'll probably link to my site and other people will link to my site because, oh, here's John McDougal talking to this really important company in the SEO tool space. So anyway, that's a quick thing to think about if you want your, your app or whatever, interview other people that are influential influencers in the app space and then you're going to get more, you know, they're going to potentially link to you because they have an ego, you know, hey, you, what's your name? Kevin. Kevin. So hey, Kevin is like this awesome guy with apps and he just interviewed, you know, Joe from apps.com and uh, now there's buzz on that and you get links. How would you, like, to try to get, like, to try to get those people, like, would you just, like, try to yeah, you could reach out on Twitter um, or send them an email. You know, go to, the, you have to dig up their email, so you can use a tool like buzzstream.com can help you find emails. Or, um, or you know, again, just like you go to Huffington Post and you see it lists who the author is that wrote the piece, you know. So you can, you know, either try and find their email address, and if you can't, you can find their Twitter handle and then reach out on, you know, Twitter, start mentioning them, and you can kind of yeah. make a connection. So this is one of my sites for legal marketing, and this is an interview where I put the, John, John Marr does the podcast, runs that, and I often do them over the phone or in our office, and then that interview you can click and listen through SoundCloud, and underneath it is the transcribed text. So every time we do, you know, if you, Kevin interviews the guy from app.com, you want to transcribe the text so Google will pick up on all those keywords you talking about mobile apps. So create great content and then share it on all the different channels. And I won't go into a lot of detail here, but content marketing is tough. You know, if you, this is the guy uh, from Moz that I mentioned, Rand Fishkin. His, um, his wife had a blog and it took her, as you can see in Google Analytics, a couple years before it started to take off. And even the wife of the guy that's like one of the best SEOs in the world, it took her a couple of years. So you just, you have to be patient and you have to find a community of people that are gonna like your content. You can go into LinkedIn communities and Facebook communities and um, you know, share your blog posts and your content. So content's really the fuel for SEO, social media and link building. And here's a lawyer site where right on their homepage, here's our thought leadership, our blog posts, our videos. <coughs> That's the kind of site you wanna build in this day and age something that highlights your people and your thought leadership. And the more content you have, HubSpot says that, uh, uh, you know, people with at least 311 page websites, not just like a couple page website, they're gonna do better than smaller sites. So again, size matters. 
and have ebooks and top of the funnel calls to action, not just contact us and buy our app, maybe give away some kind of a guide or helpful information. And you know, it's just a, a big law firm site that has uh, a lot of blogs. Yeah, yeah, blog. Here's a uh, Wells Fargo has a lot of blogs. If you have a bio page, put up, you know, thought leadership on your bio page. Write a book eventually. You can use Speaker Match to get speaking engagements. And then media coverage. PR leads is 100 bucks a month, but help a reporter is free. You can get media cover. I actually got in the New York Times because of helpareporter.com for free. Uh, this one's more targeted and for 99 bucks a month, there's a smaller amount of people that are willing to pay. So your likelihood is better to get success. Whereas I think there's 250,000 or so people signed up for free for to get the same leads when journalists are looking to write stories about things. You know, there's so many people in that that the likelihood's smaller. But again, I got in the New York Times from it for free. So, but is that, so you said these are for more for like journalists though? These are journalists looking for stories and for, for, uh, to quote you. So if you're an expert on mobile apps or donuts or whatever, um, they want to quote people, and that helps them write a better article than just, you know, you know, if John McDougall says this, this, and this. It's just me saying it, but if I include, hey, you know, I'm doing a thing on mobile optimization, and hey, you know, I should include Kevin because he's, he's on to something there, and um, so I want to interview him and get quotes. So those, those help you to do that. And briefly, this is the, I'll wrap it up here with a little quick bit on analytics. Has anyone ever used Google Analytics? No. I don't even know what it is. Well, no, I don't even know what it is. We're going to do this on Thursday. We're going to see analytics. So if you have a website, you want to install Google Analytics, it's free, and it's amazing. It shows you how many people come to your website, how many people filled out a form or contacted you. But you have to set it up and there's stuff to do, but it, it's awesome. So authority analytics, you know, if, if so th these are the channels driving traffic to this website. Organic search drove 4,490 people. I forget if this was a month, uh, which website I used for, for this. Uh, referrals, other, you know, link from the Huffington Post, et cetera, drove 4,119 visitors. Direct traffic typing in your website address, paid search, the paid ads. Social for this company only drove five visitors. Yeah, yeah, and social doesn't tend to drive as much as organic search, but it shouldn't be that well. Authority analytics, types of authority, you know, how many visitors to your site, how many visitors to the blog, how many people linking to you, how much social do you get? And so here's referrals. So this company has one, if you see there are 3,011 visits from one site, they've got way too much traffic in a way coming from one site. You, you want to have a diversity of other websites sending you, you visits. I won't go into that, but top content. So it's good to see your blog is, you know, a, a site with a blog is at the top. This is actually authoritymarketing.com, my site, which is new. And the blog gets a lot of traffic and podcasts get traffic. This is, I think, uh, I forget the t time period, a month or two or whatever it is. Um, this is a wedding site that we work with. And you can see those are all podcasts that John Marr ran with this client. And each of the podcasts is getting a little bit of traffic every month. So the more little blog posts you do, the more fish hooks you have in the water. So how does, do you guys like, so say if I'm like a client of yours, like you guys would like recommend certain things for me to do? We pick what keywords you should be focused on based on looking at your competitors and your goals. And then we help map out how to develop helpful, good content, whether it's blog posts, videos, podcasts, website pages. And then, so if you have an About Us page, that's a powerful thing for your site. You should, you know, some sites get right after their homepage or their blog. Their About Us page is often, a, you know, a heavily visited site. We just put up team bio pages on our site. And where's John Marr? Uh, John Marr, you got last month 34 people came to visit you, your page, and you're up, you're up, you're neck and neck with me. Don't get more than me because that'll make me look bad as the owner. <laughs> John's written some great blog posts, by the way, that have, one of them like, has more uh, views than almost anything on our site. So pick a niche, write a short book and a blog eventually, use podcasting and video, 
comment on influencers' work, retweet them, blog comment in a helpful way, uh, and get more media coverage using PR leads and Harrow, and eventually build an email list. If you have a list of people that like your information about mobile apps or donuts or whatever, you're more likely to have a sustainable thing than just relying on Google. You know, you want to build up an email yeah, list. Yeah. I mean, some of our clients have, like, one of our golf clients has, like, 200,000 email addresses. So if we want to run a contest on Facebook, we just blast out a landing page with the sign up for the contest yeah. of 200,000 people, and boom, we've got action. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so any que quick questions? It's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work. You do a lot of, a lot of games. I, I actually yeah. have, um, I have a question about uh, what would you suggest to this group if they're looking to do something like what you do for their career? What do they, where do they need to go? What should they be thinking about? Those kinds of things. So how many people have a website or a blog? One. So if you're in dig digital marketing, you should have a website. <laughs> What's that? If you're in digital marketing and you want to be in website marketing, you got to have a website. I, I mean, I, I put that very high on the list. And the easiest way, you could go to, you know, not that we think this is the best thing to do, but you could go to Wix or some of these freebie website things. But for now, even go to like WordPress and sign up for a free blog. Then you put in keywords and you go, wow, that's cool. Put in like your name and uh, keyword something that you're doing like graphic design or whatever. And you go, um, you know, Kevin, mobile apps, Lynn, Massachusetts. And hey, my mobile, you know, my, my website page actually shows up in Google and putting the keywords in helped to do that. So if you can experiment with your own website or a blog or even just a free, you know, free WordPress blog or a Wix website, just, I would say get experience with that because ultimately if you go to get a job in digital marketing and you don't know about websites and how they work, I don't know, that, that's rough, right? What about educationally? <laughs> um, what kind of courses should they be taking? Do they need to go for a bachelor's degree? Is what, they want a job to start doing this. Well, you know, ultimately experience in very specific things gets you a job in digital marketing. I do like on people's resume, if they have a bachelor's degree, I can see that they're committed, that it took some effort to get that degree. That's really good, that, I like that. But at the end of the day, if somebody came to me and you know, had an associate's degree or you know, maybe a, a two-year thing here at North Shore Community College, or I'm not sure how, how that works, you have, a, you have shorter programs as well? Two-year programs. Two -year programs. So if someone had a two-year associate's degree, but they were just crazy about you know Twitter or blogging or uh, maybe they're a writer on some niche topic or mobile apps maybe we needed to hire someone on mobile apps but you're just completely passionate about that you've got experience in that one thing I'm gonna hire the person that has that experience but again at least like say a two-year or four-year degree is awesome background but the problem is that if you only rely on that, you're not getting the latest greatest. And I, I think that's, that's part of the reason I'm here is to, to, to show, Diane wants to be able to say, um, you know, you should be looking at things like search engine land, search engine watch, um, you know, sites that are talking about these technologies because they change every week, yeah. you know? Like my book is already, there's, there's some parts of it that have, you know, two years ago when I wrote it, there are little bits in there that have changed. A lot of the core SEO stuff, that's all the siloing that I was talking about, all that still, the core of it is right there and awesome. But SEO, if you just rely on books and classes, you're going to miss pieces of it. I think it's essential to have a college degree. Again, I'm going to be a lot more likely to hire someone that, you know, has both if all things are equal. If you have a college degree and you have some specialty, but you can't underestimate picking a niche. And I would say, um, like, uh, I would take a class in web design. Again, even if you're not going to be a web designer or a developer, if you have a little bit of background in that, I think that would go a long way. Um, I, would, I would work on your writing classes big time, and that would be great to do here, right? Yes. I mean, our writers, I mean, and, and you remember from interning with us, right? Like, yeah. 
if you if you have a rough time writing and and you you did quite good, but um, man, I'll tell you the, the people that can't write, like I always ask interns, and it, and an internship is a great way to get a job, especially with agencies and digital marketing, but. One of the first things I ask is, oh, how's your writing? Do you like to write? And if someone goes, oh, yeah, I'm very confident in my writing. I'm like, all right, just bring them in. We can teach them the other stuff. Because writing, if, if you can't write a letter to a client eventually, I'm not going to hire you because I don't care how good your technical skills are. If you can't communicate um, all the other stuffs, you know, I mean, maybe if you were like a rocket science programmer or app developer or something, maybe we could put you over in the background and, you know, don't have to talk to clients or whatever. But generally speaking, marketing jobs, you're going to want to have some pretty reasonable writing skills. You don't have to necessarily author all the content, but editing, cleaning it up, sending good emails, Making sure it's professional. professional writing, you know. Again, not to be the writer necessarily, but just email communication. One of my employees yesterday sent an email with like nine typos. We had a client that was literally started three days before. The guy's already up our butt, basically, about like, oh, where are the results? We're like, three days? <laughs> Seriously, we just got this client. You know, and it, it's, that's too fast, you know, like, it takes time. But so my, one of my team members sent an email back to him, and it was, it was a little sloppy. There were some typos in it. I was like, oh, you know, add insult to injury. Now the guy, right. you know, so the, it's, it's important. Like, we really look at it. And if, when I see that, I have to go tell my team member, hey, man, you know, clean it up. You know, you gotta. You have to respect our level of professionalism. So yeah, writing, basic web design. What else do you think that you're you're suggesting that they do? Um, I was thinking, what about um, any of the Google certification programs? Oh, absolutely. They, they don't need a, They don't need me. They don't need the school to do that. So we're a preferred uh, Google partner, and but anyone can get the lower level of getting a Google certification. There are two main ones that I would recommend. One is Google Paid Search. Um, again, this depends if you want to run Google Ads. But I'll tell you, Google makes by far most of their money comes from Google Ads, right? They don't make money if you just click the organic results. But they don't have a website if they don't have the organic results, right? You can't have a magazine without content, so you can't sell the ads in the magazine without the articles. That's what Google is like. They have the organic SEO sorry, John, gonna, and the paid ads. Yeah. You know why you're hearing so much movement. It's because yeah. class was over okay. five minutes ago, and some people have to go to work or go to other classes. Or, so. Yeah, so or in, in a nutshell, Google on. Analytics and uh, Google Paid Search. Those two certifications are huge, and I see that on a resume, and I'm much more likely to hire. So I want to thank you guys. Thank really you appreciate so it. Thank you.